Hey everybody, Joe Rignola here, and uh, today I'm going to jump into a video uh, just to talk about some basics on glucose metabolism and, and how insulin helps with that, and, and talk a little bit about insulin resistance and insulin sensitivity, and that's going to help set up a couple of other videos that I'm going to talk about uh, how that affects your brain, it can affect your thyroid and metabolism, affect your liver function, affect digestion, um, your steroidal hormones, adrenal glands, your cholesterol, all these things. That, and talk about how all these things are, are connected and why it's not necessarily a good idea to just treat one of these things, but to look at the, the whole person and, and, and treat the whole person, the whole, the whole system. Um, I also want to just thank everyone. I, uh, I've gotten a really great response on my new book, So, Planting the Seeds for Health, Well-Being, and a Superhero Life. You could find out more about that by clicking the link below this video, um, but I've, I've gotten some really great feedback and some great reviews on Amazon for that, so um, I really do appreciate that. So let's jump in to today's video, and like I said, this is going to be a basic overview of, of glucose and insulin. Uh, so you eat, you eat something uh, with carbohydrate or, or protein, and eventually that's going to get broken down into glucose and end up in your bloodstream. Now, when you glu have glucose in the bloodstream, your body wants to get that into cells where it could be used for energy or ATP. So how it does that is the pancreas produces insulin, and insulin is going to help that take that glucose out of the blood and put it into the cell. Just to put things in perspective, um, at any given time, a healthy or normal amount of glucose to have in your bloodstream is about a teaspoon. And so the body works really hard to try and keep that in that range, that healthy, that healthy range. If it goes above that, you know, too far above that, it's, it could actually be toxic. So, um, so your pancreas uh, uh, produces insulin, trying to get that out of, out of the bloodstream and into cells. So how does it get glucose from the bloodstream and into the cell? So you've probably heard that insulin acts as sort of a key, like a key in a lock with, with the insulin receptor in a cell. Um, and that's a good way to think about it. I'm going to explain that a little bit, uh, in a little bit more detail here for you. So you have a cell here. And on that cell, you have receptors. Uh, in this case, we're talking about the insulin receptor. And again, you could think about that as sort of uh, a lock, and insulin is the key that opens up, opens up the cell. So insulin interacts with the receptor, and then the receptor is going to start this sort of um, uh, domino effect, or this, this cascade, to communicate within the cell. Uh, it's going to start with something called IRS, which is insulin receptor substrate, and that's going to talk to some other proteins and enzymes. And like I said, it, it creates this cascade effect to where it finally communicates with something called uh, GLUT4, or it's a glucose transporter type 4. And when this GLUT4 protein gets the message that there's some glucose that wants to come into the cell, it moves to the edge of the cell, to the, to the cell membrane, and then that is what, what, that's really the doorway that uh, allows glucose to cross, cross over and into the cell where it's used for to make energy or ATP. So what can go wrong in this scenario? What 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 are some of the things that can cause insulin resistance? That is that the cell some for some reason doesn't get that message from insulin that there's some glucose that wants to go into the cell. One of the things, one of the, the classic ways that we understand what's happening here is that there could be too much insulin. And again, the body likes to keep things just so, just to keep everything very regulated. But one of the ways it does that, if it, if it sees too much insulin, it wants to, it, it'll down-regulate these receptors. And so it's sort of like insulin will knock on the door, uh, but the insulin receptors don't answer, don't answer that, that knock on the door. They won't open the door. Um, that's one way. Another way is there could be something wrong with the communication in, in this long cascade of uh, this chain, this chain of events that happens between the insulin receptor and and GLUT4, there's something could go wrong in that communication. Another way that that this could go wrong is inflammation, and inflammation is is really a big one. Um, for example, uh, if your diet is very high in polyunsaturated fatty acids, these polyunsaturated fatty acids are very uh, unstable and oxidize very quickly, and that can interact with the cell membrane damaging the cell membrane and interrupting the function of, of the insulin receptor. So it's not always that there's just too much glucose or carbohydrate in the diet or too much glucose in the blood. It could be that your diet is just very inflammatory and it's causing some problems there. 
not always just too much carbohydrate. I also don't want people to get the impression that insulin is this toxic, horrible, evil substance because it's not. Um, I, people are, are always uh, associate insulin with fat storage, and that's true. If your insulin is chronically high, then you're going to be chronic, you know, in chronic fat storage mode. And have a little to have a little bit of fat storage is actually healthy and good for you. Um, but obviously, you can you can overdo that and. Uh, the body doesn't understand that there's a McDonald's and fast food and grocery stores and Dairy Queens <laughs> on every single corner here. It still is sort of wired to take advantage of food that we eat and it's going to want to store a little bit of it. And again, a, store, a little bit of, of adipose tissue is, is perfectly healthy. Um, but again, I don't want to give the impression that insulin is this evil substance because insulin is obviously required to get uh, glucose into the cell to use for energy. It's uh, also required for thyroid function. Uh, thyroid, to convert T4 into T3, which is the active form of thyroid, requires insulin. So the thought that if we just keep insulin low and you know, get that down to zero, we'll all be perfectly you know, happy and healthy and lean, and you know, we should all be on low-carbohydrate diets, and, and you know, that's the answer to all the world's problems. That's just not, not the case. For some people, that might be appropriate. A low carbohydrate might be an appropriate therapy for someone under the right conditions, but a high carbohydrate diet might be appropriate for someone else uh, under different circumstances. So it, there, there's no black and white. So what are some things that we can do to improve insulin sensitivity? In other words, to improve this communication between insulin and the cells, to, which is going to allow glucose to be used for energy uh, and a little bit less to be used for, for fat storage. Um, obviously, nutrient-dense foods are, are one of the big things, uh, but particularly a, a diet that's uh, low inflammatory. So focusing on whole foods, focusing more on saturated fats, God forbid, um, and less on, on the polyunsaturated fatty acids. Another way to improve this, this uh, absorption of glucose into, into the cell is exercise. And exor exercise is interesting because uh, exercise will directly activate these GLUT4 proteins without the need for insulin. So exercise is extremely important in, the, in this process. Appropriate exercise, again, that's going to get these glute 4 proteins to the cell membrane, uptake uh, glucose, and, without, and do that without the need for insulin. So what happens when there's maybe too much glucose in the blood and not all of it can be used in, the, in, you know, in say, muscle cells to be used for energy? Well, any excess is going to be stored as adipose tissue. Again, some of that's okay to do that, to have some stored fat is perfectly healthy and probably good for you. Um, but obviously too much of that is going gonna, is gonna to cause a whole uh, other host of problems. That's going to be it for this video. In the next video, I'm going to talk about how that adipose tissue, that, 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 that fat storage, can actually affect your brain. And from there, how it affects your thyroid and cholesterol and liver and, and hormones and, and things like that. So uh, stay tuned. I'll post the, uh, the next video shortly. And thanks very much for watching. I'll talk to you soon.